what the heck is up with that? Alrighty. Um, there are two things uh, that I would like to get done today. Uh, the first is uh, I want to get you started on um, analyzing the data that you collected for uh, your behavior, right, the sequential behavior stuff. Um, so that is separate from what we're doing uh, with the behavioral model, or rather the behavioral observations that we're going to start where you've been developing your hypotheses. stuff, uh, there will be a due date on that, but it's going to take some time, so uh, let's not worry about that too much uh, quite yet. Um, let's see, let me make this bigger so that you can see it. Uh, so here, um, and this is the same sort of thing that you can do with, um, with the data that you have. Now I know some of you probably still have copies of your data. Uh, you've turned it in, I will turn that stuff back to you so that you have access to it. Okay. Um, this is one behavioral sequence that uh, um, Chrissy Rohr did uh, for part of her master's thesis and uh, she's filled in this um, matrix here and these are for black-tailed prairie dogs. And, uh, this is segment number one, animal number one, and uh, what you see here is the number of seconds that this animal spent being whatever behavior. So uh, she has a quadrupedal vigilance, uh, quadrupedal scanning, which is different. Uh, quadrupedal vigilance, the animal is just standing there staring straight ahead or off to one side. Scanning, the animal is looking around. Uh, then she has bipedal vigilance where the animal is up on two legs. Um, alarm calling, uh, locomotion, basking, right, where they're just soaking up the rays, grooming, uh, either, um, you know, picking fleas off or something of that sort, licking themselves, they do a lot of that sort of stuff. Social interactions, which would include aloe grooming. Uh, if you guys have a dog, uh, or even a cat, sometimes your dog or your cat will start licking you. If you've been petting your dog, your dog will turn around and start licking you. That's referred to as aloe grooming. So you're grooming the dog, the dog is reciprocating by grooming you. And you ask yourself, why do they do that? Right? I mean, because your skin probably tastes pretty terrible to them. Uh, but what they're doing is they're establishing their position within the social hierarchy. Right? So it's important to them to be able to do that. And if you repress that behavior, um, then you're thwarting that whole dominance hierarchy thing. And you don't want to do that. Uh, and then, of course, there's feeding as well. Uh, so notice how this thing is set up. This animal spent 22 seconds uh, on quadrupedal vigilance. Then it spent two seconds moving. Okay. Then it spent 16 seconds, so the next thing it did was another 16 seconds of quadrupedal vigilance, 10 seconds of scanning, 32 seconds of quadrupedal vigilance, 2 seconds of locomotion, 5 seconds of vigilance, quadrupedal scanning, vigilance, quadrupedal scanning, and so on, right? So locomotion, and then it does 82 seconds of basking, and so on. Uh, so it's going through this whole sequence of behaviors, and you have to do that uh, for each little segment that you have. So this part of it 
uh, is relatively straightforward because you can do that pretty easily from the data that you've turned in, right? So all you have to do is you have your behaviors already in the sequence. You have to make a matrix like this, right, a table like this, that has all of the behaviors in it, okay? So the first thing, maybe your animal was running, so you have running. The next thing it did was, uh, it was climbing, so it climbed. The next thing it did was it was feeding or whatever. So you just fill in that table with those sorts of items, okay? All right, that's the relatively easy part of all of this. Uh, here you can see that this animal kept going and going and going, so she had a nice sequence for this particular animal. Uh, and then what she does here at the bottom, uh, she adds up here all of the number of seconds, right, some D3 to D88, so she had a total of um, roughly 85 different behaviors that this animal went through. I mean, a lot of them were repetitive. But 1,705 seconds doing this thing, 850 doing that, uh, no seconds doing that behavior, whatever that was, and so on. Okay, so now she has a sum of the total number of seconds that this is. Yours will be relatively straightforward because your sequences are relatively short. Okay? Then, uh, what she does, Uh, she takes the average. So on average, the animal spent 50 seconds being um, quadrupedal vigilance, 70 seconds being, you know, quadrupedal scanning, whatever it was. So there she has the average amount of time spent on, on each behavior. So that's the easy part of all of this, okay? The next thing that has to happen uh, is a little bit more um, complicated. Um, and there we need uh, to set up a matrix that looks like this. So now what we need to do is, and yours will be easier because you have fewer behaviors. Okay, she broke these behaviors down to a pretty fine degree. Notice this is a matrix of zeros and ones. Okay. It's not that we've thrown out all of the time data. The time data are still there, and we're going to use those. But now what she's doing is she's looking at transitions from one behavior to another. So here, we're going from quadrupedal vigilance to each of these other behaviors, OK? And look at what happens right here, this very first one. Uh, what are we computing? We are computing, we have this logic statement up here. Uh, can I make that bigger? Does that top part get bigger if I do that? Probably not. Oops, I just screwed up. Where's my little plus sign? There we go. No, it doesn't get bigger, okay? Um, but if you look at this equation up here at the top, Here's what it says. It says equals if, so this is a logical thing, right? If this is true, then the next thing, otherwise the next thing. So it says if D3 is equal to zero, let's go back and look at what D3 was. Let's go back to column B. Oops. No, I'm going to screw this up. All right, let's go back and look at D. D3 is vigilance, okay? Quadrupedal vigilance. So let's go back here. So it says, if D3, if the D3 is equal to zero, which it wasn't, okay, then put the number zero there. Whoops. If true, whoops. If D3 equals zero, then zero. If not, right, so it was 22, it wasn't zero. So that if not, then put in the evaluation of this statement. 
So this one is the same as this, only it's nested inside. Now here's what it says. If E4 is greater than 0, then 1, otherwise 0. So we have a nested logical statement. You get the concept? So the first part is, if this is true, then this. Otherwise, so on. So here we go. If this is true, no, it wasn't true. So now we go to the otherwise part. The otherwise part says, if this is true, then this, otherwise this. So we have now, we need to look at what E4 is. And it says, if E4 is greater than 0, let's go back and look at E4. E4, am I in the right place? Yeah. E4 is empty. So it's not greater than 0. If E4 greater than 0, which it's not, then put a 1. Otherwise, put a 0. Well, it wasn't greater than 0, right? So we're not going to put a 1. We're going to instead put a 0. In other words, what this is telling you is on this first instant, the animal did not go from quadrupedal vigilance to quadrupedal scanning. What the animal did was go from quadrupedal vigilance to locomotion. So let's roll over here to where it says the locomotion and see what value we get there. There it is. There we get a 1. OK? So now we have this matrix built. And that's the matrix for going from quadrupedal vigilance to all of these other behaviors. Hey, now we have the next one, which is going from quadrupedal scanning to all of these different behaviors. So we're repeating it. But now, notice we're going from quadrupedal scanning to bipedal vigilance. So we're now looking at a smaller part of this matrix. Right? Look at what the first one was. We went from whatever the behavior was to quadrupedal scanning. Notice now we're starting at bipedal vigilance. And the next one, we're starting at bipedal scanning. So from bipedal bit. So notice each of these is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then what we're doing is we're going from one behavior to the next, OK? And now we're flipping it and going the other way. And now they get bigger and bigger and bigger. The good news for you is that all of this will be set up for you, right? So all you have to do is plug your numbers in, and it will provide this information for you. So I'm going to go off the list of behaviors that you have. All of the, all of the equations will already be in there. And all you have to do is type in your initial behaviors and all of this is going to be computed. OK? All right, that's the easy part. Now, let's see. We come up with this part. So now, once we've got that, we're filling in this thing, which is sort of the raw transition matrix. So behavior is a stochastic process. You, can, you can't do it at CMO, but if you go to a bigger university that has a big probability and statistics department, you can take a course in stochastic processes. And one of the things that you're going to learn in a course in stochastic processes are Markov chains. So this is a Markov chain. A Markov chain has a transition matrix, and then you can, from that transition matrix, 
you can take the eigenvector from that transition matrix and that becomes the steady state vector. When you get your weather report, they've done exactly that. So the weatherman has built for him this Markov chain. And it says, okay, if it's raining today, what's the probability that it's going to be raining tomorrow? Or, if it's raining today, what's the probability that it's going to be sunny tomorrow? And so on. So he can multiply all those things that matrix against itself, or he can solve the matrix, find the eigenvector for that matrix, and then get the steady state vector. So here we have the animal spent quadrupedal vigilance, quadrupedal vigilance, 1,705 seconds. From quadrupedal vigilance to quadrupedal scanning, 10 seconds, and so on. Okay? So here's that matrix we've used, all that other stuff to complete this matrix. Alright? Great. So that's the raw matrix. That's not the matrix that we need, though. What we need to do is we need to convert all of these things into probabilities. And the way we're going to do that is as we do right here. Okay? So here what we've done on this particular case, that's right, that's our first animal, there were a total of 1,738 seconds being quadrupedally vigilant. So here, that gives us, based on the number that we had before, the probability of going from quadrupedal vigilance to quadrupedal vigilance is 0.98. So there's a 98% chance that the animal goes from being quadrupedally vigilant to quadrupedally vigilant. So if it's quadrupedally vigilant now, there's a 98% probability that it will be quadrupedally vigilant in the next time interval. Okay? And a 2% chance that it's going to go from being social to locomotion. Alright? Great. That is the transition matrix that we want. We're not done. We now need to take that transition matrix and we need to find, there are two ways to do this, we need to find the steady state vector. Okay? That means you need to know a little bit of linear algebra and you don't. Okay. Has anybody here had linear algebra? You, have you ever had to solve the characteristic equation to, to extract the eigenvector and the eigenvalues? No. So there, one way we could do it is by using linear algebra, solving the characteristic equation for this matrix, and then coming up with the steady state vector. But you've not had linear algebra. So we're going to do it, and neither had Chrissy Rohr. She didn't have linear algebra either. So I said, that's fine, we'll use the brute force approach. What happens is this, if you take a matrix and multiply the matrix by itself, you get another matrix with the same dimensions. If you multiply it times the initial matrix again, and again, and again, and again, and again, it's going to produce a vector which ultimately ends up in the steady state. So before we do that, do you guys know how to multiply two matrices together? You, not, you didn't learn that in high school? Let me show you very quickly. I'm afraid to turn this projector off. We'll come back to it. Do this. 
then I'm going to explain to you why you should all send a thank you note to Bill Gates. All right, so let's imagine we have a vector or a, a matrix, a three by three matrix. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So there's our matrix. We're going to multiply that matrix times another matrix, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the product of those two matrices is going to be this matrix. A times one, so one A, plus four times B, plus seven times C. Okay, then two times B plus, where am I going? Points that way. Oops. That rows times column, that, that. Did I? So this is a 3 by 3, that is a 3 by 3, so I should get a 3 by 3 matrix. So it's that times that, right? That times that, and then I'm going to get that times that, and that times that. So let's do this first one. So the next one is 1D plus 4E plus 7F. And the next one is 1G plus 4H plus 7I. Okay. Now for this next one, I'm going to get 2A plus 5B plus 8C. Then I'm going to get 2D plus 5B plus 8F. And here I'm going to get 2G plus 5H plus, where am I going? Two, yeah, that, that. So 2G plus 5H plus 8I. Then, for the last one, I want 3A plus 6B plus 9C. Then I want doing that. So now 3D matrix 
and square it again, and square it again, and square it again. And by the time I've multiplied that matrix times itself a bunch of times, say a hundred times, I will have reached the steady state vector. So that's one of the theorems of Markov chains is that if there are no absorbing states, it will reach a steady state. And we want to reach that steady state. So you can write all these little equations in to an Excel spreadsheet. So you can write in to square this matrix, and then you can write it in again to square the matrix again, and then you can write it in again to square the matrix again. So you're going to be writing those equations in for about 100 different times. So it'll take you about a month to do that if you use every free second that you have in order to do that. Or, what you can do, you can solve it for the eigenvector, except to have an add linear algebra. Or, what you can do is you can turn towards Seattle and just bow gently to Bill Gates once and say, thank you. Because what Bill Gates has done is he has this little procedure in Excel, M mult, and then you specify the matrix that you want, the two matrices that you want to multiply together. So matrix A1, A, B, C, uh, A1 to C3, okay, comma, and then whatever the next matrix is. And then that gives you the result. It's very sweet and easy. Okay? You just cop copy it, paste, 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 and it gives you the result just like that. Very sweet. Okay? The result of all of that then is, let's see if I have that here. Oh. Let's go Of course, one of the things that you have to do, notice all the divisions by zero there. So that's something that has to be dealt with. We need to get rid of all the absorbing states. What is an absorbing state? An absorbing state is a behavior that once you get into it, you can't get out of it. So this So let's go down to one that's a little more interesting. So here is that vector. Oh, you can't see that, can you? for the same behavioral sequence that we were looking at earlier. Okay. So if you look at this thing, this animal goes from quadrupedal vigilance to quadrupedal vigilance 97% of the time, from bipedal vigilance to bipedal vigilance 83, 66, 83, 50, and so on. Okay. Now what you want to do is you ask yourself the question, what is the steady state vector? And what you're going to do then is multiply this times a matrix of ones. And that will then give you the steady state vector. Let's see if I have that anywhere.
I don't. But what, what it ends up giving you, if you look at that matrix that has all of those transition probabilities, and you say, okay, let's imagine this animal starts in quadrupedal vigilance, right? We're gonna multiply that out. And what it shows you that ultimately the animal should be spending this percentage of its time doing this behavior, this percent doing this behavior, this percent doing this behavior, and so on. And the result that you get is different than just looking at your behaviors and saying, oh, from my observations, the animal spent 50% of its time feeding, 20% of its time being vigilant, and um, you know, 30% of its time grooming. You get a different result. Why is that? Because this takes into account the history. Just as when you go through a sequence of behaviors, you don't go from one behavior to any other behavior. If you're brushing your hair, the next thing you do, right, is probably putting on your makeup or putting on your shoes or grabbing the leash for your dog or something of those sorts. You're not going to brush your hair and then go into the shower. Unless, you know, you're different from every other person I've ever known, okay? You're not going to, you know, sit down to eat and then wash your hands while you're still eating, okay? So you go, you have a specific sequence of behaviors. It's, it's a stochastic process, but it's non-random, all right? You don't get in the car and drive down the road and then start the engine, right? You have to start the engine first before you can drive down the road. The same is true with these animals, the same is true with you, right? Behaviors follow specific sequences, and that's what we're trying to find out. So, how does this differ from what you're doing for the squirrel behavior module that we're working on? What's the difference in what you're learning? This approach right here is much more detailed, much more complex, but gives you a higher quality answer than what you're getting from the stuff that you're doing, okay? So why are we doing it the way they're doing it on this module? We're doing it that way because we're substituting quantity of data for quality of data. These data are high quality, but it's hard to get lots and lots and lots of it. The student that worked on this project had hundreds of hours of video that she worked through, and she probably spent thousands of hours working on it, okay? I spent hundreds of hours putting these spreadsheets together for her, okay? It's hard, it's a lot of time and effort. The way you're doing it through the Purdue model is you're substituting quality data for quantity data. So instead of taking all those sequences into account, you're just saying, oh, the animal spends this percentage of its time being vigilant, this percent grooming, and whatever. And it's not exactly right, but you now have access to all these data from all of these other studies, so the result is you're able in a very easy way to test these hypotheses. You can test the same hypotheses here, but it's going to be harder, okay? So what is it that you're getting out of doing it this way and the other way, okay? You're beginning to comprehend that sometimes, right, this can be really challenging. Sometimes getting at the right answer is gonna take a lot of work and you're getting some basic Excel skills, which is positive as well. Hopefully, you know, if you're thinking about going to graduate school, you realize that sometimes, right, putting a little extra effort in on the front end gives you a bigger payoff on the back end. Okay, so what I will do is I will return, if you don't already have um, your behavior data, I will return it to you, I will return a copy to every member of your group, okay? So that what your next step then is sometime over the next week is to fill in the first part of that table, right? Remember what that looked like? Uh, 
Oops. That table. Okay? So you're just going to fill in this first table right here. And that'll be the first part of it. And then we'll take it piecemeal, bit by bit, so that within the next four weeks or so, we will have figured out what the steady state vector is. Okay? Yes? Yes, with the, with the data that you collected out there on academic terraces, not with the data that you're now collecting for, okay? okay. So this is a separate assignment, and I'm trying to make it as easy as possible, so you're going through all the steps, but you're not going to be doing all the brutal typing in the equation stuff, so all that work will have been done for you. All you're going to have to do is plug your numbers in, right, and then watch the result that it gives you. Okay? Awesome. now is talk a bit more about population growth and I want to make a few extensions uh, to those population growth models. So let's begin by reviewing what we know up to this point about our population models. The first model that we have uh, was dn dt equals rn. That's a simple differential equation. The beauty of differential equations is, and I suppose this is a relative sort of thing, the beauty from my perspective is that usually you cannot solve the differential equation. So most differential equations do not have solutions, explicit solutions. This one does. The solution to this equation is that n is equal to n sub 0 e to the rt. It's a simple differential equation, and it has a simple solution. And the solution to that equation is this. If this is t and this is n, it gives you a curve that looks like that. If you've been looking at the COVID-19 data for SEMO, it produces exactly that graph. So COVID-19 is spreading on the SEMO campus at an exponential rate. Okay. Because most differential equations do not have explicit solutions, we have to have a way to estimate what the solution is. And we're going to do that. Okay? You don't need the explicit solution. All you really need to know is what the behavior of the model is. Differential equations are used to design the circuit board in your phone. There is no solution to those equations. However, you can model what the behavior of the, the equations is. You can take a course, I don't think you can get that course here at SEMO, but in a bigger university with a bigger math department, you can take courses in estimation, right? Courses in numerical methods, where you figure out how you can estimate what the solution to a particular differential equation is. All right, the next thing we did was we took this model and we improved it a little bit. We said Rn times 1 minus n over k. And this has the added advantage that now there is some k 
the population is going to approach that carrying capacity and stay there. Versus this one, where it just continued up like that. And we also know that if the population starts at carrying capacity, it's going to stay there. If it's below carrying capacity, it's going to increase. And if it's above carrying capacity, it's going to decrease. The downside of that particular model is that sometimes if the growth rate is too large, the population is going to oscillate. And every time it goes down like that, that's pain and suffering. And or it's going to exceed it by too much and then go extinct, which is what we would like to avoid. The other problem with this particular system is that the carrying capacity is not a constant. It changes over time. Currently, our carrying capacity is determined by access to energy and access to water. I don't know if you remember from the presidential election from four years ago, but one of the big um, issues at that time was coal and coal mining. And Donald Trump wanted to bring back coal, and at the time Hillary Clinton was essentially saying coal is dead. So who was right? Did they bring back coal? Are there more coal mining jobs today than there were four years ago? Anybody have friends or family or relations that are coal miners? No. Anybody familiar with coal mining? Ever been in a coal mine? No. There are two ways of mining coal, right? Three ways of mining coal. One is to tunnel under the earth and excavate the coal in that way, which is extremely dangerous. Um, a lot of people die doing that. The other way to end, end up with black lung disease, another way to do it is the way they do it in the Appalachians, is they just cut off the tops of mountains to take it. Okay. Uh, and then there's the way they do it out west, which is strip mining. So in the Four Corners area of um, New Mexico, they have dump trucks with tires as big as this room. I mean, if you were to lay the tire down in this floor, you wouldn't have room to walk. That's how big those tires are. And these things, and they are strip mining the Four Corners region. They're just shaving off the whole soil and everything, removing all the coal, putting it into dump trucks, putting it on trains and delivering it to Nebraska, okay? Coal is going away. Why is that? Why are coal mining jobs disappearing? Because we're using it faster than it's made. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's part of it, but more, there are a couple of things that come into play. Number one, it's not very environmentally friendly to strip mine or to cut the top of the mountain off because if you strip mine it, you have to return the land to its original condition. And that's expensive. One of the things that Donald Trump has done is an executive order that prevents that requirement from being enforced. So now when they strip mine or take the top off of a mountain, they can just leave it. Okay? Which ultimately nature will take care of it. Okay? But it sounds it's not good, right? The other issue is that the cost of getting the coal is higher than the cost than the benefit from selling the coal. And because of that, all these coal mines are shutting down. All these coal operations are shutting down because it costs them more to mine the stuff than they're going to get when they sell it. Same thing has happened just recently, right, in the, at the start of the COVID epidemic with the cost of oil. All these oil facilities in Texas 
couldn't sell their oil. They were paying people to take the oil. Because they have new oil coming in, they have this backlog of oil, right? They can't do anything with it. They were essentially, they couldn't even give it away because the demand was so low, so they were paying people to take it. Well, at some point, we deplete that resource, and when we deplete that resource, the carrying capacity drops, which then means that the possible population size we can have is lower as well. Our lives depend on access to energy, whether it's solar, wind, whatever, but the lights, your phones, your clothing, everything that you do is dependent on energy. If you've ever gone backpacking for, say, three or four weeks at a time without access to electricity, you get a sense for how easy electricity and power makes your life. We have it pretty cushy, okay? All right. The problem with this particular model and with this one is the fact that it oversimplifies what population growth is all about. Because population growth is really a function of births minus deaths. So we need to know the birth rate and the death rate. Back in the 1960s, when people were concerned about population growth, they just looked at this R and said, oh, we need to make R smaller. So they were thinking about, we need to convince women to have fewer babies. Notice we weren't convincing men. We were convincing women to have fewer babies. Okay? Men have got nothing to do with it, right? Demographically, that's accurate. Socially, it's nonsense. Demographically, the male doesn't matter. The male is nothing more than a female's way of transferring sperm from one generation to the next. Okay? You guys think you're all so important and so special? You're not. You're just a scrotum delivering sperm to the next generation. That's it. Okay? So, that solution obviously didn't work. It didn't work for us, and it didn't work for China. So there has to be another possible solution. And that other possible solution is the one that relies on this idea. And that is, we're going to take births and deaths and treat them a little bit differently. We're going to take births and think of it in terms of the fecundity function, and we're going to take deaths and think of it in terms of the survivorship function. So the fecundity function is mx, the survivorship function is lx. So if this is age 0 and this is age 100, and there's 50, and there's 25, and there's 12 and a half, right? Most females are going to have a fecundity function that looks like that. So peak reproductive value right there, RV, peak reproductive value occurs at about age 16. What we mean by reproductive value is your ability to produce offspring, okay, and in a very real way, the ability of your offspring to, re to produce offspring. So it's, in a sense, your reproductive contribution not only to this generation, but to future generations. So if you re start reproducing early in life, and you produce daughters or sons, those daughters or sons have an earlier start and can start reproducing, right? So you're ramping up production, right? If you wait until you're 40 to have your first child, some people are already grandparents by the time you have your first child. 
So you've basically lost an entire generation. So by starting to reproduce early, you are increasing the potential for reproduction, for reproductive output. That's what we mean by reproductive value. Your highest reproductive value is at age 16. By the time you're 45, your reproductive value is almost zero. Sure, you can still have a kid, or two perhaps, but you've now waited so long to produce that kid, you've basically lost a couple of generations in between. So you're now behind everybody that started reproducing early in life. So the way we were talking about controlling population growth was not by saying to women, hey, just have one baby, or hey, only have two kids in life. No. What we don't want to do is tell people how to live their reproductive lives. You want to have 12 kids? Fine, do it. I think you should. I love kids. Okay? But... The key is, instead of starting having kids at the age of 16 or 15 or 14, let's convince a, a certain portion of the population to wait. So let's shave off that first part of that curve. So if we can shave off that part right there, that is actually sufficient to increase the average generation time and dramatically reduce the rate of population increase. And we don't have to shave off very much before we reach a steady population size. That's all that's required. So how do we do that? Easy. All you have to do is convince a greater portion of the young female population to seek a career path. Get them into an apprenticeship, get them into a training program, get them into college, into junior college, get them into a nursing program, get them into a business program, an entrepreneurial program, whatever it is. Get them on a career path so that they decide they would like to delay the start of their family for a little while. We're not talking about delaying the start of their family by five years or ten years. If you can delay the, that by six months, a year, two years, you've had success. That's all we're asking. And it doesn't have to be everybody, and there's no reason to look at some 14-year-old mother and poo poo her. Right? Because the decisions that she made were not made in a vacuum. Okay? So you don't push them off to the side, you offer whatever support you can, I think, for those people. All right, that's part of it. The other thing we can do is shave off the top. And how do we shave off the top of that curve? We shave off the top by convincing women through public service announcements or support programs or whatever to put more time between their babies. So instead of having a baby every year or every other year, have a baby every third year or every fourth year. So if you can convince families that your children will do better if there's more time between them, that's a positive thing. If somebody has a baby every year, again, nobody makes decisions in a vacuum. Okay, so don't go looking down your nose at those people. The other part of this, the death rate, looks like that for white people. Looks like that for brown people. Looks like that for black people. Okay? Why is that? Poverty. Okay? 
So being poor, not having access to high quality food, not having access to health care is a huge deal. It's good. What we should do, in some sense, is convince more people to die young. But that sort of goes against what we're all about, right? So I don't think we're going to make much progress talking about survivorship, okay? I think our efforts need to be focused on the fecundity function. That's where we need to do our work. Because the medical profession is all about keeping people alive. The Affordable Care Act is all about keeping people alive. Okay? Social welfare programs are all about reducing poverty. You might ask yourself, why is it if, if poor people are really so poor, why are they so fat? Why are poor people in general heavier than middle class people or wealthy people? Healthy food is, is really expensive. Healthy food costs money. Okay? A burger and fries is cheap and has a lot of calories. Okay? Poor people eat poor people food, and poor people food is high in fat, high in calories, high in cholesterol, high in salt. And if you look at the diseases that affect poor people, it's diabetes, right? It's heart failure, it's all those things that are associated with a poor diet. Okay, so here's what we want to do now. We know those basics. Let's go back to this equation right here, and let's look at this equation in a slightly different way. I'm going to rewrite that. It's the same equation. Okay? All I've done is instead of 1 minus n over k, 1 is the same as k over k, so I've just rewritten the equation like that. Let's imagine now uh, that we're talking about two organisms living together, so two species living together. So let's define, this is some resource axis, let's define some attribute of this species. Let's imagine Species A uses resources like that. So I don't know what this resource axis is. Maybe we're talking about birds or lizards, and these are small seeds. And these are big seeds over here. Okay. So most of these birds are eating seeds that are roughly that size, but a few of them are eating smaller seeds, and a few of them are eating bigger seeds. What determines the size of the seed that a bird eats? The bee. Part the bee. So if you look at something like a cardinal, The beak looks something like that. If you look at a goldfinch, the beak looks something like that. So the goldfinches are really good at eating thistle seeds and things of that sort. These guys are very good at eating sunflower seeds and bigger nuts and things of that sort. Okay? So big bills enable you to eat big seeds, little bills enable you to eat little seeds. Now, can this guy with a little bill eat a big seed? Yeah, sure. He's going to work on it for quite some time, though. This guy will eat that seed, boom, just like that, and it's gone. This guy might have to work on it for several minutes before he finally gets it processed. 
So in terms of big seeds, this guy won't be as efficient at big seeds as is this guy. By the same token, this guy is not going to be as efficient at handling little seeds because he can't really manipulate them correctly. It's like you taking your fingers and trying to pick up some really, really, really tiny, tiny, tiny little thing and manipulating it, like all the little parts on a watch and you're trying to put them together, your fingers are so big and clunky and clumsy, it's almost impossible to do. So you need special tools in order to do it. All right? So we can think about this. There's one bird. Here's the other one. There's species B. And this one, I'm going to call that X2, X1, or XA and XB. How's that? So now we have two species, and the two species are on this resource axis, so we have big seeds over here, and small seeds over here, and for the most part, the goldfinches are eating little seeds, and the cardinals are eating big seeds, but there is a range, an area over here, where there's overlap between the seeds that they take. So the question is, what happens in that region of overlap? Well, let, let's think about this curve first. Let's think about humans. Let's think about football, OK? So imagine football players as being a species. And when you think of people on a football team, not everybody on the football team has the same physique. Okay? Because guys that are on the offensive or defensive line physically look fundamentally different from the tight ends or the running backs. How do they differ? Nobody watches football anymore. Nobody gives a shit. I certainly don't. I'm glad the Rams are gone. Fuck them. I'm glad the football Cardinals are gone. Screw them. I'm pissed. I'm a bitter old man, okay? I admit it. But how do they look different? Nobody watches football? Really? Yeah, they're huge. The offensive and defensive linemen are big kids. You know, they're at least six feet tall, probably, you know, 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, it's hard to find one that weighs less than 250 pounds. They're usually up there around 270, 280, 290 pounds or so, okay? They are big boys. Why? Because they need to make sure that nobody crosses that line from the other side, right? I mean, they are their physical, the one team is they need to get across that line. The other, if you're a little tiny guy, as a defensive lineman, you're going to get killed. You need to be big. Now, how's about the tight ends? What are those guys? What do they do? What do the tight ends do? Back in the day, when the Chicago Bears were one of the dominant football teams in the NFL, there was a player named Refrigerator Perry. I think he weighed 380 pounds. He was a hoss. He was a big boy. And he was on the offensive line. And on one play, he actually scored a touchdown. So he's on the offensive line, and he picks up this ball, and he runs like 10 yards or something to go across the goal line. And nobody could stop him. He's just this big guy. Nobody can drag him down. He's just running across. He's massive. Three, have you ever seen a 380-pound guy run? I mean, it's not graceful. I mean, the earth is shaking as he's crossing that goal line. I mean, he's just this monstrous guy lumbering. 
He can hardly get his feet off the ground, he's, but he's lumbering across there. Slow as heck, okay? But he gets the job done. Now, what does the guy, the tight end, do? He's racing down the field. He goes 30, 40 yards downfield, turns and catches the pass, right? Is that going to be some big fat guy? No. It's going to be some guy that's tall and lean and has muscular legs and has a slight upper body to minimize mass. He's going to be really fast. Those are two different physiques. So you have, you can think of it as being the big hoss guys on this end and the fast, you know, agile guys at the other end. The same thing is happening with the birds. Some birds of these goldfinches are going to have really tiny, slender beaks. There's no way they can process these bigger seeds. But there are going to be some of these guys which have slightly bigger beaks, which enable them to process some of the bigger seeds. Just like in this class, we don't all have the same physique. Some of us are shorter, some of us are taller. Some of, some of us are slender, some of us are heavier. Okay? Some of us are blonde, some of us are auburn haired, some of us are, are, you know, brunette, black hair, whatever. Some of us have straight hair, curly hair, whatever. We're all different. The same is true for these goldfinches. So some of them are going to be really good here and not so good here. So the question is, what's happening right there? In that area of overlap. Yeah, they're both going for the same seeds. Okay? So they're both consuming the same seeds. It's not a huge proportion of these guys. It's not a huge proportion of these guys. But there is some overlap there in terms of the seeds that they're going after. Now, these guys aren't perfectly efficient at it. The goldfinches aren't perfectly efficient at it. The cardinals aren't perfectly efficient at it because they're not very good at getting the little tiny seeds. These guys aren't particularly good at getting the big seeds. But they are using some of the same food resources. So now, what should you do? If the food, right, let's look at the availability of food. So let's think of this as the resource availability curve. This is the resource utilization curve. We have another name for that. We call that the niche. So the niche of its species in our treatment here is simply the resource utilization curve. The niche of a species is where it lives and what it does. All right. So there's this guy back in the 1930s. And he did this clever little experiment. What he did, this time, he took some paramecia, and if you've had general zoology, you, you've probably studied paramecia. Did you guys study paramecia with Jeff? Does he go over paramecia? It's, there's sort of an argument, and I know that the phylogenies have all changed, right? The whole 
Five Kingdom system is sort of out the window and whatnot, but there was a conflict about whether Paramecia are single-celled organisms, really animals, and so on. Doesn't make any difference. There's this organism called Paramecium, and what he did was he had two species of Paramecium. He took the first species and put it in a petri dish, and every day he would put the same amount of food in that petri dish. And every day he would count how many Paramecia he had. So he takes the petri dish and puts it under a dissecting scope. And on the bottom of the dissecting scope is a grid. And he doesn't count every paramecium because he can. There are 100 little squares on that grid. So he takes 10 of those squares at random, and he counts how many paramecia are in that square at that moment. Then he goes to another randomly chosen square. And then he multiplies times 10. And what he does is he, he counts every day how many paramecia he has, and he graphs it. And it does that. Then he does the same thing for species B. So there's species A. There's species B. One of them is Paramecium caudatum. The other one is Paramecium. I forgot the species name of the other one. The other one does exactly the same thing. Okay? In other words, they follow our logistic growth model, our very simple logistic growth model. They follow it exactly. So they reach a carrying capacity, and then they stay there. So the next thing he did was he put the two species together in the same dish. And when he did that, when he put the two species together in the same dish, he got one species that started like that, and then did that. The other species did that. In other words, one initially had a higher growth rate and started off by gangbusters, but then drops down goes extinct in the petri dish. The question is why? Why did that happen? So together, or separately, each one grows logistically. You put them together, one of them grows logistically, the other one starts off like gangbusters, and then goes under. All right, just think about it. So, uh, let's think about fast food. On Broadway, down close downtown, there's a place, I don't know what it's called now, uh, it used to be Stevie, Stevie's Wonder Burgers or Stevie's Burgers or something like that. You guys remember that place? Little burger joint right there. They were open till, I don't know, they were open till at least 3 in the morning. Okay, they probably open all night or something like that. But you drive by it and nobody was ever there. But they had good food and it was reasonably priced. But And then you have down the street, you know, a couple miles down the street is a Burger King and McDonald's and those places doing like gangbusters. Why didn't Stevie's Wonder Burgers make it? You can think of the fast food restaurants as being species. So instead of eating seeds, they're taking money from customers. So they're they're resources they're going after are the dollars in the pockets of customers. So here's this customer base out there, and the fast food restaurants are harvesting dollars from the customers. Same, same principle. Well, let's think about Burger King and McDonald's. 
So here's Mickey D's, and there's Burger King. Think about the history of those two restaurants. McDonald's is first, right? They date back all the way to the early 50s. Okay, and where was that? Glendale, California. Okay. So what does McDonald's sell? Really? What do they sell? Fast food, burgers, fries. Burgers, fries, what else? Shakes. Yeah. Anything else? Can you get a salad there? Easter. I don't know what to anymore. Uh, you can get breakfast burritos. You can get muffins. Okay. What, what kind of snacks can you get? Desserts can you get there? Pie, you know, some sort of apple turnover, or some such thing, or a cookie, or whatever. How about Burger King? What do you get there? Same stuff. So it seems that they're doing exactly the same thing. Or are they? Are they doing something different? Are they doing something different? Well, we know the Cardinals and the Goldfinches are doing something different. Their bills are a little bit different. So you're trying to tell me that you've never been to a McDonald's or a Burger King. Is that, is that the message that you're giving me? Who has a who has a preference? If you had to choose Burger King or McDonald's, where would you go? McDonald's. McDonald's. Where would you go? Where would you go? McDonald's. You wouldn't go to either. Where would you rather go? McDonald's, McDonald's. or Burger King? McDonald's. So why would you prefer McDonald's over Burger King? Only one person prefers Burger King. Why would you prefer McDonald's? You like the fries? Fries? I think they're burgers are better. Burgers? Burger King has vegetarian options. Good for you. Why would you? I like the fries. Fries? You know, you understand those fries are bad for you. Okay, it's nothing but salt and grease. Okay? clogging your arteries. You understand that, right? You can get away with it while you're young, but at some point... All right. So, McDonald's here in town, uh, they don't do it anymore, I think, but they put a little outdoor play area, okay, where kids could play. Why do they do that? You guys, when you were little, probably played there. Why do they put that playground in there? Do you think they do it just because they feel like they're good members of the community and they're nurturing the children of the next generation? Do you think that's why McDonald's does anything? Hell no. The only reason McDonald's or Burger King or any of those places do anything is to make more money. They are in business to make money. They do not give one whit about you. Okay? So why do they put the playground in? To make money. How does it make them money? Because the stressed out parents need just a few moments of peace, show up there, Keep the kids occupied while they can have their coffee or soda or whatever in peace. Just a few moments, please, right? Wear these kids out, take them home, put them to bed for a nap or something. Good Lord, give me a break. That's what it's all about. And the kids love it. And to boot, they get a Happy Meal with a toy. 
So they're training the kids at an early age to love McDonald's. So what does Burger King do? They put in a play area, but their play area is better because it's indoors, not outdoors, which means now it's an air-conditioned comfort. What does McDonald's do then? At the McDonald's they have down by the mall or down by the Walmart or whatever, they put in a two, three-story play area that's also air-conditioned. So it's this battle to see who can give them, get the most you know, intriguing play. It's all designed to train the kids at an early age to love McDonald's or to love Burger King. And guess what? It worked. Because one, two, three, four, five of you, five out of the six of you are going, yeah, I'll go to Burger King or to McDonald's or wherever. They got you hooked. What I'm waiting for is the revelation that both McDonald's and Burger King have stock in funeral homes or anti-cholesterol drugs or something like that, okay? So now, imagine your Hardee's. And you open up a Hardee's restaurant right there at the corner of, of Broadway and West End Boulevard, where that Arco's Pizza place is now. What happened to that Hardee's restaurant? They went belly up. They couldn't cut it. Why couldn't they make it? What's wrong with Hardee's? What's wrong with Hardee's? Did anybody remember that restaurant? Probably not. It was probably gone before you got here. It was different than Burger King and McDonald's. The first thing you noticed when you go into that Hardee's down there at West End and, and uh, Broadway, the floor was sticky. You'd walk in and your, your sneakers would stick to the floor. And then, this was back before they banned smoking in restaurants. The whole back room was just chock full of smoke, so where you'd want to eat was just smoky because all these gimpy old geezers were sitting back there, including Gary Rust from the Southeast Missouri, back there drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, telling jokes and stuff, and reading the local fascist rag, okay? And the fun part is that Gary Rust is in there reading, his, reading not his paper, but the St. Louis Post-Dispatch which I always thought was really, but it stank in there, and it was dirty, it was sticky, and it was nasty, and it was all these old people in there, no kids in that place, because they didn't have a park or a playground. And I don't even think they had Happy Meals. Okay? They didn't make it. So what happened? What would, so here's Burger King, here's McDonald's, and Hardee's is trying to do that. Sort of split the difference right between, and it didn't work. The question is why? Well, the same thing happened to Hardee's as happens here. You put them together, and one of them makes it, and one of them doesn't. Why doesn't one of them make it? Why does one make it, and the other one not? Or are we all equally good at getting resources? Look at you guys and come back in 10 years. Some of you guys will have made it. You'll be in great shape. You'll have some big paying job with some state or federal agency or you'll be in private business or whatever. You'll have a big fancy house and big you know, Mercedes or something like that out front and wearing all this, you know, awesome clothing and stuff. It would be easy street. And some of you might be happier, but be working, making paycheck to paycheck, right, and all that sort of stuff. You're not going to be the same. The question is why? And the answer is because this guy right here is more efficient at converting food resources into offspring than is this one. 
This one was more efficient at getting and converting resources than this one. So for every ounce of energy that this one got, it produced more offspring than this one. It got more offspring, it was more efficient at converting that energy into new offspring. So what Gauss did then was he said, well, that's sort of interesting. He did the experiment again. This time, on the bottom of the Petri dish, he added something. He added some crushed glass. So at the top of the Petri dish was just open water, and on the bottom was crushed glass. And he put exactly the same amount of food in the Petri dish every day, just like he did before. He put both species in there, just like he did before. And now, when he graphs it, one species does that, and the other species does that. The only difference between that one and that one is the crushed glass. And you're looking at that going, holy smokes, the heck just happened? Why is the result different? Why do you think the result is different? What does the crushed glass do? Think about your life as a paramecium. What do you do in your life? Do you swim around, gobble up some food, split into two? Make copies of yourself, okay? How is that different once you add crushed glass? What's going on? Why is it different? Ideas, somebody, tell me a story. Why is it different? One more than the other. Okay, so one maybe swims differently, something like that, or one is feeding differently. Or maybe one is better at being in the open water and the other one is better feeding amongst the little on the bottom amongst all the little shards of glass. Just as in fish, some fish feed out in the open, some fish are bottom feeders or amongst all the detritus on the bottom, something of that sort, okay? That's exactly what's happening with these paramecia. This species feeds out in the open and it's really good at getting the food when it's out in the open. This species, on the other hand, feeds on the bottom along corners and things of that sort. There are no corners when it's just open water. Because of that, this one is much more efficient at getting the food and making babies than is this one. So this one, once the numbers get big, proportionally, it's eating more and more and more of the food. There's nothing left over for this one. It goes extinct. Now, however, you've added crushed glass. This species gets the food while it's still floating at the surface. Some of the food settles to the bottom. This species is getting the food once it's hit the bottom and is amongst all the little broken shards of glass. So Gauza sees that and he right away realizes the significance. And he comes up with a name for that and he calls it the competitive exclusion principle. Competitive exclusion principle. And 
And the competitive exclusion principle says that no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. No two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. Because here there's one niche, the open water. One species makes it, the other one doesn't. Here now, we have two niches. One niche is the open water. The other niche is all the spaces amongst the crushed glass, and now they both coexist. So no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time. Here we have two niches, here there is just one. Okay, so now let's go back and think about this area right there. These are the available resources. If there's an infinite supply of resources, are organisms going to compete for the resources? They're not. Okay? You go to the all you can eat buffet. They're putting all this food out. They're constantly replenishing the food. Do you go up to the all-you-can-eat buffet and fight for access to whatever it is you want? No, because it's constantly being replenished. There's an infinite amount of resources available that you're not competing for. On the other hand, on the other hand, you're sitting down at a table, and there are 12 of you, and somebody puts a pizza down, and there are eight slices. Oops. There's going to be some competition for those eight slices. Right? So if the resources are unlimited, there's no competition. It's only when resources are limited that you have competition. So how does this influence the population growth of that species? How does this influence the population growth of that species? Let's refer to that right there as alpha. So alpha is that area of overlap between the two species. We have dn dt equals rn times k minus something. does that area of overlap affect the system? So we are now talking about a very specific kind of competition. The kind of competition that we are talking about is exploitative. to interference. In interference competition, I'm in, in this building, we're competing with the cockroaches. We're interfering with the cockroaches, right? We're changing this habitat, we're interfering with their ability to exploit the entire space. That's interference competition. Interference competition is when two guys walk up to the all-you-can-eat buffet 
there's only one chicken wing left, one guy is going to elbow the other guy and grab the chicken wing before the other one can get it. That's interference competition. Okay? House comes up for sale on the market. You, you and somebody else goes looks at the house to distract the other buyer. You burn his car or something. Keep him preoccupied and now you buy the house. That's interference competition. Exploitative competition is you're better at converting that resource than the other one. You're more efficient. So what effect does alpha have on species A? Species A has a certain carrying capacity. Okay? What effect does alpha have on species A? Let's imagine the resources are limiting. So let's add up these two curves. What do we get? Use a different color. And add these two, the curve for species A and for species B together. I know it's not very good. I'm going to get something that looks like that. Okay? Because this. So starting here, right, it's species A plus I have to add to it species B, right, so it's going to look like that. So that green line is adding the curve for A plus the curve for B. How does natural selection treat individuals that are in this zone of overlap? Are you at a selective advantage or a selective disadvantage? disadvantage? You're at a selective disadvantage. So what should natural selection do? Is, the, is species A in this area, right here, in this part of the niche, is that one going to have the same reproductive output as one that's over here? No, because it's sharing resources. It has less resources available to it. So it's not going to produce as many offspring. In other words, natural selection is operating against that species. So what you expect, the result of natural selection should be to minimize overlap. So you should go from that to that. Natural selection should operate to reduce competition. The model that we're using here are exactly the same models that economists use to study the economy or to study the growth of businesses. It's exactly the models that the guys at Burger King and McDonald's use to figure out where to put restaurants, how to change their menu, that sort of stuff. It's exactly the same. They're going through the same analyses. They are attempting to develop their businesses into that. They're trying to carve out a separate niche. McDonald's, they have a certain kind of fry. Some of you like that fry. Burger King has a certain kind of Oreo cream pie or something. Some people go there just for that. You go into a Burger King restaurant, it's a little bit upscale compared to the McDonald's restaurant. McDonald's has a $1 menu. Burger King has a $1 menu plus something else, right? They're trying to divvy you up. Burger King has the veggie option. They're trying to capture that part of the market, right? They're trying to divvy this thing up. They're trying to separate themselves, make themselves more distinct. They're trying to reduce the overlap. All right? So 
So that overlap detracts from the growth of species A. The question is, how? So species A is sharing a certain proportion of its resources with species B. What proportion? Call this N sub A for species A. N sub A for species A. Okay? And the growth rate is R sub A, and the carrying capacity is K sub A. So that's how we know we're talking about species A. So we're actually going to have two equations, one for species A and one for species B. The equation for species B is D N sub B DT equals R sub B, N sub B, times K sub B minus something divided by K sub B. So my question is, what goes in right here? What do we fill in there? Well, what did, we, what did we have in there before? So we're just talking about one species. Dn dt equals Rn times k minus n over k. There's got to be something with n. assignment for next week. We need to figure out what goes in in the other part of that equation. Okay? There's your hint right there. Good. So you guys, are you guys on Friday or Wednesday? Friday? Okay. I'll have your um, squirrel observation data for you on Friday. We will meet here again on Friday trying to um, perfect your hypotheses and get the experimental design together. Um, were you able to talk to Elizabeth? Um, I was going to text her today. Okay, good. Let it, let it know. Great idea. See you guys on Friday. Do you already have an internship on Well, I was just wondering when they read it for the internet or technology. Yeah, so how I should be consistent. Yeah, so when did you graduate? I'll be there doing this. So, yeah, so the thing to do is to sign up. Yeah, I'll be there doing this. So, yeah, so the thing to do is to sign up um, as a, you need to sign up for internship hours. Okay. Okay. So that's what this is for. That's what this will be for, right? Okay. So you need to sign up for internship hours um, and just do that with me. It'll have to be for the spring uh, semester okay. because I'm not going to teach in the fall semester. Um, does that is that a certain like section that I go into? Or? Uh, yeah, it's in the it's in the course catalog. You know, you look up on the courses and there is a okay a for internships. I forgot what it is. Okay. I, 
four or something or other. I don't know, I, I didn't, it's not 489, but it's one of those. So they're reading, readings hours, um, independent research hours, and I think one of those is internship hours. Okay, I was just really unclear what you handed me that. I yeah. I didn't quite understand. Yeah. So, okay, this room, and you will automatically, I guess, kind of put me with those internship hours. Yes. I think that, okay, yeah. awesome. Sounds good. Thank you. I was having some trouble with it too as well. So can I get to like download seven point three for Windows and it's not good. Are you are you doing that on a Windows machine or a Mac? Windows. Okay. What did I end up doing? I had the same problem and it's still really funny. Is it a desktop machine or a... It's my laptop. Do you, you don't have it here, do you? I do, I have it in the front. Yeah. 